Hello, friends. It's Chop. What had been doing been done in their name? Assassination, mind control experiments, spying on American. You know, people were shocked and horrified. I mean, now we're much more jaded and we, we assume or expect it. But at that time, Americans were shocked at what the CIA had done. Well, you brought him up. I mean, he, uh, James Jesus Angleton is a character that we, we've sort of mentioned obliquely on the show before. He's a, a, a real vampire in American history. Uh, could you just give our listeners some background on, on like who, who, who James Jesus Angleton really was and like how he got such a notorious or infamous reputation as a kind of a, a spy master and in, involved in some of the most <laughs> evil things in the agency's history? Yeah. So Angleton was a a fascinating character to write about in The Ghost for all of those reasons that you're talking about. Um, He was friends with Dick Helms. Um, They had both been in the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. Angleton came from an interesting background, a kind of nouveau riche background. His father was a self-made millionaire who, who rose in the ranks of the National Cash Register Company, which was a big multinational company in the in the 20s and 30s. Angleton grew up in Rome. Uh, his father was close to the fascist government there in the in the 1930s. He went to Yale, um, and he was a very worldly guy at a very young age, um, which was striking. And 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 one reason why people gravitated to him for all of his flaws, he was he was kind of intellectually charismatic. And uh, he uh, is in the OSS during uh, World War II, where he's assigned to Rome, a city he knows very well, and where he's totally plugged into the elite. Um, and so he starts working with Alan Dulles at the end of the war um, and then uh, hangs around U.S. intelligence. And when the CIA is created in 1947, he, like Dick Helms, is in on the ground floor. Angleton then is friends with the top British intelligence official in Washington, Kim Philby. And Kim Philby and Jim Angleton were fast friends. They had met in England during the war and reunited in in Washington uh, in 1949 and 1950. Kim Philby, of course, was a Soviet spy. And so he took his poor friend Jim Angleton to the cleaners. They talked about all sorts of covert operations, and Philby would immediately pass this on to the KGB in Moscow. This had a big effect on Angleton's personality, made him very paranoid and very concerned about Soviet penetration. So he gets himself appointed to be the chief of counterintelligence at the CIA. What is counterintelligence? Counterintelligence is the defensive aspect of intelligence work. You know, espionage is where you go out and steal the other guy's secrets, okay? Counterintelligence is where you're trying to prevent the other guy from doing that to you. And so Angleton devotes his life to searching for Soviet moles within the CIA. And it eventually drives him crazy, probably because there wasn't one. But along the way, he amasses incredible power, develops an extensive relationship with the Mossad in Israel, helps Israel steal the technology for the atomic bomb, helps develop the mind control experiments. A guy who's really kind of totally out of control and finally is kind of brought down by rivals within the agency because his, his influence is so destructive on the organization, but a fascinating character and, you know, quite a lethal one, a, a dangerous um, man. You mentioned like he was, he was consumed because of his relationship with Kim Philby. He was consumed by this, uh, this perpetual, uh, sort of like a, like a, a witch finder general to find Soviet moles everywhere in the CIA yes, and yeah. the United States government of which there really weren't any. However, like, what do you think accounts for that as opposed to MI6 in which there were many? Well, th- th- this is what this is what everybody in the CIA said was, you know, MI6 had been penetrated by Philby and others, and they wanted to make sure that it didn't happen. That's that's why Helms kept Angleton on despite a lot of misgivings, because he said, well, at least we've never been penetrated, you know, uh, and he, he sort of trusted Angleton to do the job. The problem was that Angleton was acting on the flimsiest of evidence, like so this one Soviet defector said, oh, yeah, I think I knew I knew who the mole in the CIA was. And his name began with K. Angleton went through CIA personnel files, called in every officer whose name last name began with K, questioned them, found something to suspect in all of them and ended their careers on <laughs> Just everyone with the last name K. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so like talk about well, guys, this is like the trial, Joseph K. Jesus. It, it, that's exactly what it's like. It, it was straight out of Kafka. And eventually, you know, Angleton was searching and he had he had files after he was fired. 
They went through the, the CIA went through the files and he had named 40 names. He had 40 suspects for the mole. And the CIA, another CIA officer reinvestigated all of those names. And he said, there was not compelling evidence against any one of them. It was, it was a figment of his imagination. You know, by the late 1960s, the guy is pounding the martinis. I'm not talking three martini lunch. I'm talking five martini lunch. That was the norm for Angleton. And, <laughs> And and for a lot of people, very, very well well lubricated gentlemen. Yeah. I mean, saying, yeah. I mean, you, look, if you're looking for a mole, you got to be loose. That's exactly right. And and Angleton, he, Angleton was he was an interesting character because he was an intellectual, and so he's looking for grand patterns, and he's you know he's he's a, has a kind of creative mind. I mean, it was kind of crazy too. But so yeah, so we thought, well, I'm just you know I'm thinking outside the box, you know, by back, sacking all these guys whose name begins with K. I mean, like, okay, so you're like, Angleton is sort of an intellectual guy. Howard Hunt is a guy with literary pretensions. I mean, like, there's this sort of pattern here of, you said, like, the agency, like, they were the cool, sexy part of, you know, uh, the U.S. empire, as opposed to, like, the, the very, you know, square military guys who, you know, you could set your clock by their haircut and things like that. But, like, yeah, like, like these guys, they had a bit of flair. They had some personality. They had these eccentricities that, that sort of drew, that drew them to this world of intelligence. Yeah, and that's why people always said, and it was true in a cultural sense, that the the CIA was was very liberal compared to the FBI or the or the military. You know, yeah, this, these were the more intellectual type uh, type of people, definitely. I guess, like, so, like, what I'm thinking, like, about all this is, like, so you have all these guys, like Angleton, Helms, uh, like the, the 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 OGs, the originators, the guys you sort of like were. Uh, sort of sired out of the OSS and like came through in like the cauldron of World War II, um, looking at a, a war that came about as close to destroying humanity as anything in human history. And then after that, the specter of uh, nuclear warfare even gr- have a green greater potential to destroy humanity. So you say like they, I mean, should like in their own minds, they all believed that they could justify anything they were doing because it like under the rubric of preventing another world war and, you know, uh, countering yeah. the dominance of the Soviet Union. Right. And this, anything could be justified personally or politically by the threat of communism and this, like, the, the, the greater game of the Cold War. However, it, like, as with Angleton, like, it, it, it's, all this stuff bleeds over into their personal psychology and their personal will to power, and national interest often gets confused with personal interests. And I'm wondering how the, the sacred nature of secrets in this world and the way secrets are managed and kept. Like, how do you see that? Like, I, I, I view it just sort of as a way in which the borders between what is national interest and what is the personal or institutional interest of an, the agency like the CIA and the people who work for it become obscured and protected. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, you know, there, there's, there's some striking examples of that. I mean, Dick Helms was not a dumb man. Um, and he knew what all of his analysts in the, in the in the Directorate of Intelligence were telling him about the war in Vietnam. You know, the Directorate of Intelligence, that's not the dirty trick side of the organization. It's like a high-powered university. It's like, you know, scholars, area experts in all sorts of topics. And so they assign the Vietnamese and the Asia people to study the problem. Are we winning the war? Who's winning the war? How many casualties are there? Like, just figure out what's going on. And the CIA is very pessimistic from 1963 on, you know, uh, saying we're not winning the war. We're not going to win the war. Um, and this this eventually floats up to to, to Helms. And he he asks uh, one of his analysts to say, you know, what would be the result if we just pulled out, if we just were no longer involved in this war? And he gets this very thoughtful 30 page report, which we now have which says, you know, yeah, it would certainly change the region, uh, but, you know, in the long term, wouldn't really affect U.S. interests very much. Helms, for Helms, this document, he's like tiptoeing around like he, he cannot, he's frightened to show it to anybody. And he finally takes it to Johnson. Of course, he only tells this story many years later to make himself look good. But he, 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 he takes the, the memo to Johnson and he gives it to him. And it's like, if this leaks out, it would have been, it would have been like front page in all the papers because, you know, Three successive administrations have been saying, you know, we're winning the war. And if we don't, all hell will break loose. You know, the Soviet Union will conquer the world. And it just wasn't true. And Helms knew it wasn't true. He gives the memo to Johnson in 19, late 1968. And um, Johnson never says anything to him about it. 
and Helms drops it. Then Nixon comes in, the ne- you know, within a couple of months, Nixon and Kissinger want to escalate the war. They don't want to end it. And, and Helms never passes along this memo. And Helms knows that, the, that they're not going to win the war. But he tells Nixon, he supports Nixon to the hilt. Why? Because it kept him as CIA director. And that was Dick Helms' greatest dream in life, was to be CIA director for as long as possible. And so he totally sacrificed his, his, the national interest for his personal interest, and secrecy enabled him to do it. Well, I mean, and then so his dream, his lifelong dream is to be director of the CIA. But of course, Watergate and all this is proves to be his undoing. Like, how do you see like like how do you see like the, the, the sort of parallels and contrasts between Richard Nixon and Richard Helms? How do you think that plays into their sort of mutual undoing? What, what happened to Helms well, and, and like what, what led up to his perjury conviction? So, 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 so if you think of Helms and Nixon have managed to forge this working relationship um, over the course of of Nixon's first term. Helms has backed Nixon on expanding the war. He's backed Nixon on expanding domestic surveillance. He's done him the personal favor of providing a a dirty trickster like Howard Hunt. Things are going swimmingly. And then the burglars get arrested. Nixon threatens Helms. Helms does not like that. And the interests of the two men drift apart. And so at that point, Helms is just protecting his agency. He's not protecting Nixon anymore. And Nixon fires him. Helms extracts a favor in exchange, an appointment to be ambassador to Iran. And then, but here's where the Watergate scandal begins to evolve into the CIA scandal. In in his last, in his interview for to to be ambassador to Iran, Helms is asked about CIA in Chile, which the CIA had been very active there. And Helms had, in fact, presided over the assassination of a Chilean general who was thought to impede U.S. policy there a nasty piece of work that happened in 1970. And Helms lies. And he's under oath. He's in open session. And he says, we didn't have any operations in Chile. We weren't trying to overthrow the government of Chile. We had nothing to do with that. Pro forma denials, CIA directors do them all the time. Well, when Watergate starts to blow up and people are like, wait a second, you were helping Howard Hunt with the Daniel Ellsberg thing and the burglary? And people just start asking more questions like, what's going on with the CIA? And and then uh, Nixon is forced to resign and the Watergate investigation ends and the CIA has kind of, you know, made it escape clean. But then Seymour Hirsch breaks his big story at the end of 1974 about the CIA domestic spying. New York Times plays this story really big. And then that leads to the exposure of the assassination plots against Castro. And all of a sudden the CIA is, you know, They've been lying to Congress about the Kennedy assassination. They've been lying about assassination. All of a sudden, all this trust that has built up over the first 25 years, we're the good guys, you know, all of that, you know, Vietnam, the government's lack of credibility is eating away at the government's credibility just corrosively. And nobody believes the CIA and the government anymore. And so that's when Congress launches this investigation. And all of a sudden, Dick Helms, the CIA, in self-preservation, hands over to the Justice Department and says, well, Mr. Helms's testimony here might not have been exactly accurate. And the Justice Department in this post-Watergate era of like, let's clean up the government, good riddance to Nixon, we're going to do business differently now, you know, Watergate babies in Congress, you know, and t- a total transformation of attitude uh, from five years before. And so the Justice Department decides, look, we can't have CIA directors lying to Congress. I mean, our system doesn't work unless the different branches of government can hold each other accountable. And so they decide to charge Helms. Helms is, you know, thinks he's totally right and he can lie whenever he wants, but he's got this very nasty story that they're on to about the assassination of General Schneider in Chile in October 1970, an operation directed by Dick Helms. And so he has to plead guilty. So from that burglary, both men fall. You know, Nixon has to resign two years later, and five years later, Helms has to plead guilty to a crime, the only CIA director ever convicted of a crime. So Watergate led to the downfall of both men. I mean, there, I mean, he didn't do any jail time for this. I mean, like, <laughs> when the Nixon was pardoned, no, you know, it led, to the, it led to their embarrassment. But, you know, it was a slap on the like, wrist. It, 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 it stands in because it's the crime that we all know of that, you know, a, a lawless president and then like in, in, in your story as well, also like a, a lawless agency, a lawless central intelligence agency. But like it's the most minor crime 
out of all of the associated crimes that surround it, be it, you know, the uh, uh, global assassination program, the overthrow of democracies, uh, the Bay of Pigs, uh, the expansion of the war in Vietnam to Laos and Cambodia. I mean, like there are like all of like the, the truly like uh, true atrocities that surround it. The fucked up burglary is like the, the most minor one, like, but it's Pretty the one much. that has the most outsized uh, purchase on the American uh, sort of mythology. Well, you know, thanks to Hollywood and Woodward and Bernstein. I mean, they they defined the story in the imagination. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a palatable story. Us journalists, you know, we love it. We know oh, the heroic, you know, reporters, shoe leather reporting and all that. And, um, you know, they did a good job in, on that aspect of the story. But, you know, they really didn't know what was going on. And one reason why is because, you know, the Congress, they really don't want to know what the CIA was doing. I mean, if you accept the need of a clandestine service, then you're pretty much accepting the need that they're going to lie to you in order to hide what they're doing. And so, you know, the idea of accountability in a clandestine service, it's sort of a contradiction in terms. And, you know, nobody nobody really wants to, wants to hear about it. I've been interested in the reaction of my book is when I say, you know, the CIA, the hidden hand of, of, of the CIA is the untold story of Watergate. Nobody argues with me. It's it's perfectly evident if you if, if if you look at the if you look at the record, you know n- nobody would dispute it. All right, I'm going to ask you a question now that uh, you know you may not give be able to give a satisfactory answer to, or your answer may not satisfy our listeners. But this yeah. are, as it relates to an idea in the, the episode we did on Watergate. Uh, I'll, I'll be as ginger here as possible.